All right, let's welcome in former Arkansas assistant, longtime assistant under Eddie Sutton, also the head coach of Texas Tech in Houston. He went 30-2 and two in 1996 with the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Coach James Dickey now joins us. Coach, good morning. Thanks for making some time for us. It, there was a recent article that Clay wrote when Eddie Sutton was selected for the Hall of Fame, and he talked to you and he talked to some others. And I found it fascinating that when you're watching Coach Sutton's television show on Sunday nights, you sent him letters trying to get on the staff. What really got you thinking, hey, I, I want to coach for this guy? Well, good morning, guys. Uh, Ty, Tommy, and Clay, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I, uh, I'm i honored uh, that you would have me on. It, uh, it was really uh, interesting to me uh, when I graduated from uh, – college at the University of Central Arkansas, uh, I just really wanted to get a, a high school job. And uh, my dad, uh, who was, uh, he was a smart guy, he said, there's a, there's a guy over there at Arkansas named uh, Eddie Sutton that's a pretty good coach. And uh, he said, you ought to think about getting your master's and uh, see if you could learn some basketball from him. So that started uh, a five-year a program for me trying to uh, get on with Coach Sutton. Luckily, at the time, I, I got on with Coach Jess Busey at Harding and got my master's at, uh, at Harding University. And then uh, I watched Coach, uh, Coach Sutton's shows every Sunday night with a notepad and uh, wrote him a letter uh, every year for five years. And thanks to my great friend, uh, Jimmy Counts, who's uh, now a, a doctor in Northwest Arkansas, um, I was able to finally get on uh, with Coach Sutton in 1981. Coach, one of the things about coaching, there's a fine line between grilling a guy for making a mistake or knowing when to kind of embrace him and hug him and, and or just be kind of more softer tone. And, and you mentioned in this article that Eddie Sutton was masterful at that. How was he so good at conducting, dealing with former play, or with players? Well, first of all, he really he cared about his uh, players uh, tremendously, and uh, uh, he always uh, felt like that uh, players uh, would accept uh, constructive criticism. They'd accept coaching if you knew they if they knew you cared about them. And uh, uh, he always cared about his players, not only on the floor but uh, off the floor uh, as well uh, about their families. Uh, he and Miss Sutton were both very big on uh, education. Uh, they wanted the players uh, to do well uh, in school, strive for their degrees, uh, and that was always important. So the, the players knew uh, that uh, he cared about them, but he just had that uncanny ability to know when to uh, really con- uh, constructively criticize a guy or to put his, uh, put his arm around them, and uh, he could get maximum results both ways. Coach, there's very few people we could have on the show to, to give us some real perspective about Coach. I mean, a lot of people are going to ask basketball questions. Fill in some cracks. Give us give the audience more detail about who Eddie Sutton was as a person, as a person because no one spent probably more time professionally with him than you did. Well, Coach Sutton was, uh, you know, he, he grew up uh, as an only child in, uh, in Buckland, Kansas, and uh, uh, so uh, he grew up... Uh, around some great coaches uh, that were at Kansas. And then obviously uh, Mr. Abba uh, at Oklahoma State. Uh, he was a very good uh, player. He, uh, you know, he played against uh, uh, Wilt, Chamber- Wilt Chamberlain. He talked about that game uh, a lot because uh, I guess he was sick but had one of his best games uh, against Wilt Chamberlain when he was at uh, Kansas and then just became a great uh, a great student of the game. And the one thing that's very interesting, other than his year as a graduate assistant to Mr. Iba, uh, Coach Sutton was never an assistant coach uh, to anyone. He uh, became the head coach at Tulsa Central High School, uh, then went to Southern Idaho, did a great job, came to Creighton, Arkansas, Kentucky, and then back to his uh, alma mater. But he was never an assistant coach. And I always thought one of the things that was fascinating about that uh, is he really uh, knew uh, how to uh, inspire his assistant coaches, and he's produced so many head coaches uh, over the years. When, when you look back at his great staff, 
that he assembled when he first came to Arkansas, and, uh, which uh, I thought was uh, one of the best decisions he ever made was to keep Coach Pat Foster uh, on the staff. And uh, Coach Foster did a great job and went on to become a very successful head coach, Gene Cady. Uh, but, uh, and then, of course, Bill Self, who's a Hall of Famer, who's an assistant coach. But he's had uh, others, that like Dwayne Casey, who's the head coach of the Detroit Pistons now, who was at, was at Kentucky, Leonard Hamilton, who's at Florida State. Uh, so he just had some uh, great assistant coaches, and, and he understood how to uh, to handle the assistants, even though he'd never been one. That was always pretty amazing for me. Did he ever tell you what attracted him to the Arkansas job? Because when he was at Creighton and, and came to Arkansas, the, the Arkansas program was not in very good shape. It, it had seen some real low times, and, and Coach Sutton was the one that turned that around. What what a, Did he ever tell you what attracted him to come to this job at Arkansas? When he did, well, that's a great that's a great question. You guys have really got some very interesting uh, questions. Clay probably knows this, but uh, Coach Sutton had interviewed uh, with Coach Broyles uh, about the Arkansas job before, and actually turned it down uh, the first time when he was at Creighton. Uh, and then uh, Coach Broyles went back to him the second time, uh, and uh, he uh, he felt like that uh, there was finally going to be a commitment. Uh, to the uh, Razorback basketball uh, program, even though uh, Coach Van Neeman uh, had uh, had the running Razorbacks and uh, had them uh, rolling, uh, he uh, he wanted to go to a different uh, level, and uh, he felt like there was a commitment there. And obviously, uh, it started out when they made the transformation of, uh, of Barnhill Arena uh, from where it was to, to what it became, and. Uh, so he, he felt like that, uh, as he always called it, it was a sleeping giant. James, uh, I want to I want to move to his coaching, and uh, that that's always what I like to do is talk when when you're talking about Coach Sutton. And you told me a story. Well, I asked him about I asked you about his defense and what made it tick. And you you referenced a, uh, another great coach. Uh, just just tell us the the Charlie Spoonauer take on, on Coach Sutton? <laughs> well, uh, Coach Spoonauer is a, a great person, great coach, uh, unbelievable uh, speaker, and uh, just extremely uh, smart. And, uh, you know, had a connection uh, with Coach Sutton because he worked with uh, Mo Abba, uh, at Nebraska. And, uh, you know, Coach uh, Spoonauer did a terrific job at uh, – what is now Missouri State. It used to be Southwest Missouri State, but what's now Missouri State. And uh, Coach Sutton had uh, had wanted to play regional schools in home-and-home home situations, and he wanted to talk to Coach Spoonhauer and had me call him about um, playing. That was a, a really short uh, conversation, Clay, because uh, when I talked to Coach Spooner, he was very cordial, uh, and uh, he was always very nice to me, but he goes, why well, Why would I want to play a team that won't let you pass and catch? And I thought that was a great compliment because if you remember the way that we played, we played tremendous pressure on the ball and denied uh, one pass away, and uh, I thought that was a great uh, compliment to Coach Sutton by uh, Coach Spooner by saying, they won't even let you pass and catch the ball, so we're we're not interested in playing. Yeah, eventually y'all did play him, and there were some great games. They did. They uh, coach yeah. didn't play. I'm not sure he played when, uh, but he he did. Uh, he had a great relationship with the people. Bill Rowe was the athletic director at uh, Missouri State at the time, and uh, uh, Coach Sutton uh, had a relationship with. Um, uh, it, it, it developed with John Q. Hammonds uh, in Springfield, so. Uh, we did play them, and uh, you know I went on and played them. Not when Coach Spooner was there, yeah, but I think I it was Cleveland uh, four times yeah. when I went to Tech. So uh, it was always a good relationship and a, a good regional uh, rivalry. James, uh, you know we we tend to focus on on defense when you when you think of Coach Sutton, but his offensive ability to coach in his system. Of course, there's no shot clock. Just. Just kind of detail what y'all did and what y'all worked on in practice that y'all took to the game as far as offensive strategy. Well, that, that's a that's a great point, Clay. Because when you look back at the as we look at basketball today, uh, when you have the um, the shot clock and the three point line, which were two of the obviously huge changes uh, during my uh, 
uh, career, but uh, we won that Southwest Conference Championship in 1982. Uh, actually uh, sealed it at uh, SMU on the road. There was no shot clock. Uh, there, there's no three-point line. But what he convinced players to do, and none more evident than 78, when he had the, the triplets, and, and all three of those guys uh, could have scored uh, a bunch of points. Uh, but he was able to convince them uh, to play uh, within their roles. And, and, and he he always emphasized not only to coaches but to the players about understanding what your role uh, is on the team. And uh, uh, he was strong in his conviction uh, about taking care of the basketball offensively, not uh, turning over. Uh, shot selection uh, was huge for him uh, to understand players uh, what was a good shot, uh, and it might not be the what's a good shot for one player might not be a good shot for the other player. So there was certainly a lot of teaching that was going on. There was a lot of counseling to, for players to understand which shot they should take. And I might add, you know, it was one of the most difficult things for players, but he was able to convince them to do that. And then I thought he was a master at teaching the, uh, the passing game. Uh, and, and one of the things that's interesting today when you watch the game uh, everybody uh, wants to run a ball screen. Everybody's going to talk about how you're going to defend uh, the high pick and roll. How you're going to defend the side ball screen. Uh, early on at, at Arkansas, we never screened on the ball. Uh, we always would pass and cut or pass and go away. We didn't do a lot of ball screen. That was one of his uh, uh, rules in the uh, in the motion offense. But uh, he was able to get players to be very disciplined uh, on the court. Uh, he was a great uh, teacher of the game, but as you mentioned, Clay, it all started on the on the defensive end. But uh, uh, he knew offense as well. Coach James Dickey with us on the morning rush, longtime Eddie Sutton assistant, former hub coach of Texas Tech and Houston. Coach, you you were a part of a couple really big wins at Arkansas, and we've talked about these pretty extensively. The win against Michael Jordan in North Carolina and in Pine Bluff, and the win over Akeem Olajuwon in Houston in Barnhill Arena. Of those two games, which win do you appreciate more? <laughs> well, that'd be a tough question uh, because uh, I-, I can remember uh, the game in uh, Pine Bluff so vividly that you know we drew up the play for uh, Alvin Robertson, uh, Doc Sadler, who is uh, uh, another uh, great coach that spent a lot of time with uh, Coach Sutton and uh, has been the uh, head coach at UTEP, uh, Nebraska. Seth and Miss Doc had the scout on that game, and uh, Charles Valentine uh, uh, hit the shot. And uh, you, know, you remember it's close to Valentine's Day, uh, and then Scott Hastings hit the shot against uh, over the outstretched arms of Hakeem Olajuwon and uh, and Barnhill. Uh, both were great. Uh, both were great uh, victories and big wins. Uh, I guess. When you look at it, uh, you go back historically, the win against Carolina was big because uh, they were number one. Uh, they were undefeated. And what's so, when you go back, and I know it's been several decades, uh, almost uh, 35 years, uh, but uh, those games were played on Sunday uh, on national television after you'd already played conference games on uh Wednesday and Saturday. And just one is interesting tidbit about that particular game. We played a and on Wednesday night uh, in College Station uh, and just barely eked out a win on the road. Then played SMU, who was very, very good. They had John Conkag, had a great team. We played really well uh, on Saturday afternoon uh, and won uh, in, uh, in Dallas. And then we had terrible weather. I actually had... Uh, left Dallas and went to Cushing, Oklahoma to watch Stephen Moore play and went back to Fedville and was going to meet the team in Pine Bluff on the next day. And the team couldn't get out because of storms. Mm-hmm. And it was really rough on uh, Sunday morning. They had a charter plane that flew into Pine Bluff. Actually landed one hour uh, one hour before tip-off. And, wow. you know, everyone talks about the scouting report and the preparation. Team actually got there, got dressed, good set and had time to get the guys warmed up a little bit right five starters on the board, who they were going to guard, and then we went and played the game. And just a tremendous game. I remember Joe Klein had, you know, it was 10 for 10 from the free throw line. Daryl Bedford had a big game. And then, obviously, Charles uh, hit a huge uh, baseline shot. And then, uh, if you remember, Clay will remember this, uh, 
they ran a play at the end of the game. Dean Smith threw the ball to half court and called timeout. Uh, we did a good job covering uh, Michael, uh, but we left Steve Hale wide open from the corner. Steve Hale was from Tulsa, who Jimmy Counts had recruited really, really hard, and Steve, uh, he was wide open in the corner, and luckily for us, missed a shot and came off on the, the weak side. But the, just a little history behind that game, which was a really big win. Coach Sutton's teams were 120 and eight in games played in Fayetteville. That's nearly 94% of the time Coach Sutton's teams won at Barnhill. What made his team so special and so so lethal in Fayetteville? <laughs> that's, a, that's one of the neat things for me was to be able to, uh, first of all, be a part of uh, Coach Sutton and, and, and that staff. Uh, Fred Trinkle was there. Bill Brown was there. Jimmy Counts was there. Doc Sadler was there. Jimmy Dykes was there at the time. So we had some you know, just wonderful people uh, to be around. Uh, but Coach Sutton really uh, talked about that home court advantage and uh, obviously uh, the relationship that he de- developed with Jim Robkin and the Hogwall Band, and that, that place was really special. But the fans, the enthusiasm of the fans, the way that they uh, uh, would show up for the games, and uh, Coach Sutton talked about educating the fans on understanding, you know, uh, how to help your team uh, win at home, but uh, our teams played with the terrific confidence, and uh, and he would uh, he would always tell them in the huddle, hey, somebody's going to make a big play, uh, somebody's going to get the the momentum going, and uh, but uh, the home court advantage uh, was a combination of things. Uh, obviously, the, the the great players that we had uh, made a huge difference, but uh, the crowd, uh, the band, the atmosphere was. Uh, really important as well. James, tell us about an Eddie Sutton practice. Just just what what was what, a two-hour or whatever. I don't know how long you'll practice. But. <laughs> hey, uh, I wasn't thinking about two hours. The first word that came to my mind was long, long practices. And I will just give you an example about that. Uh, I don't remember very rarely ever having a two-hour practice. Now, yeah, they have practice restrictions now, the hours – uh, where you have the number of hours you can practice in a day, uh, the number in a week, and you have to take the mandatory day off. I can remember, Clay, many, many years, the first we started practicing on October the 15th at that time, uh, the first day we would have off was Christmas break. Coach Sutton didn't believe in days off, and uh, he believed in working, but uh, normally we'd practice three hours a day. He loved practice. He loved the teaching. The majority, the majority of time, uh, was spent uh, on uh, defensive drills uh, in the defensive end of the court. Uh, and he spent a lot of time. He was a great tactician, great teacher, but we spent a lot of time. And, and I will tell you, he stuck with that because the year between when I was at Tech and before I joined, rejoined him at Oklahoma State, I actually did uh, – I worked uh, with John Holcomb out of Tulsa, and we did television uh, for the Cowboy Sports Network. And I went in to watch the practice before the last conference game of the season in 2001. They were playing a on Saturday evening when he was having a practice, and I thought, well, this would be a short practice day before the game. It'd be one hour and a half. He went three hours uh, <laughs> the day before the game. So he believed in, in working, believed in long practices. He believed in guys being mentally tough, and uh, they were gonna, we were going to work uh, when you came to practice. I mean, once the, what he, he, he didn't like the stretching. Uh, he, we strength coaches did a great job stretching, getting guys. He didn't like the, the warm ups. When he got ready to go to the drills, he'd step on the floor. When he blew that whistle, we went to work, and uh, that's what it was for three hours. Coach Dickey, let's let's end it with this question here, and we appreciate your time this morning. If Coach Sutton were able physically, and if he was if he was with us still and able to give the speech, and his health was not good at the end. What would he have said at his Hall of Fame induction speech? Because we all got, I think we all got robbed out of a great final Eddie Sutton speech. What What do you think would have been on his uh, his agenda that day? Well, I won't speak completely for him, but I will say this. First of all, I think it would be very uh, elegant, uh, eloquent. He had a, uh, uh, he was a masterful speaker, uh, did a great job. He could command a, a room. He could command an audience. But uh, he'd, think his, he'd, he'd think his family. Uh, there's no doubt about that, the support that Miss Sutton and the boys uh, had given him over the years. But uh, he'd thank his players. Loved his players dearly. Uh, he would thank them. Uh, certainly thank uh, 
all the uh, fans and, and people that uh, influenced him and supported him uh, at every stop uh, that he made. And uh, he uh, he would thank the people that uh, gave him the opportunities along the way. Uh, he would obviously speak about uh, Mr. Iba, he'd speak about uh, uh, Coach Broyles, uh, Cliff Hagen, and just the, the different people that uh, and Mr. Iba who helped bring him back to to uh, Oklahoma State, uh, and Coach Sutton would uh, he would be thankful for the game of basketball because uh, he had great respect uh, for the game, and, and he talked about uh, what it done for him and uh, for his family. And I just think that'd be a few things that, uh, and, and obviously he'd be very appreciative to the people that uh, voted him into the hall. Coach, one last question before we let you go. You went to school with our own Clay Henry. What was Clay like? <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm going to tell you what. That guy was a great person and a great writer uh, when he started out uh, uh, writing back at uh, UCA and uh, has continued uh, to do well. He's not only become uh, uh, you know one of the great writers, but uh, and does radio with uh, you guys. Does tell me. I understand that also – Besides his family, he's become quite a great uh, fly fisherman, and uh, so uh, most have, of us that uh, have you seen it, or is that just what he's told you, Coach? Well, I have not seen it in person, but, it, but I've heard good. I've heard <laughs> very good things. About it. <laughs> legend, right, Coach? It's the legend. <laughs> they get those those fish get bigger and bigger, especially yeah. as each year goes by. They get a little bit bigger. Well, Coach, thank you for carving out some time for us this morning. James Dickey, former head coach of Texas Tech in Houston, longtime Eddie Sutton assistant. Coach, we really appreciate it. Tommy, Ty, Clay, thank you guys for having me on. It's certainly been a pleasure and honor. Absolutely. Our honor to have you. And uh, great. Uh, guys, I don't know of anyone that could have uh, given us better insight about Coach Sutton. Clay, is there anyone that spent more time professionally with Coach Sutton? Than, no, than I mean you could cast? talk about you. Know, you could you could talk to one of his sons, but that's what that's what James is like. Yeah. And he didn't mention this, but it, Eddie would also he would thank James Dickey, Jimmy Counts, Pat. Fall. You just go down the list of the guys that that James named, but James Dickey would be in that speech, and I that that's the cool thing. 